So you have a little boy, Kitto. I do. How old is he? Eight months and two days, I've got to get this right. And the little darling woke me at 4.21am this morning uh, with a particularly troublesome snuffle and cough, but we are fine. What sort of personality do you think he's got? Uh, bubbly, bouncy, cheeky, uh, and always smiling, which is very sweet. He's just very optimistic. He has a positivity about life that is... Uh, he wakes up smiling and he basically lives his life smiling, which is wonderful to see. His glasses brimming over, let alone half full. Kitto, though, will always be your third child. Yes. Um, the first child that you brought home from hospital. Yeah, first take-home child. Um, what, what happened? To, what were the other so, two? Flora and I did IVF and struggled for very many uh, years to conceive and eventually had twins who we uh, managed to get just beyond 20 weeks. And then, sadly, in COVID, uh, they came too early, basically, and uh, one came and went very quickly and the second child uh, lived for a very long and difficult day, but we were able to share that day with them. And uh, we then uh, came to terms with the loss, but you, uh, you never regret the journey you've been on, if you know what I mean, and you never regret trying, albeit, like many parents, we weren't able to take our children home. What, how, what happened when you first found out that your wife was pregnant? Um, well, obviously, uh, most of all, if you've been on an IVF journey, it's relief, trust me. It, it's such a tough journey, particularly, obviously, for the woman. But as a couple, IVF is a miracle, you know. None of, our, none of these people who have had IVF would have been able to conceive 30 years ago. As the pregnancy progressed and the babies got bigger? Well, first of all, you, you realise you're pregnant, then you realise you've got twins, mm -hmm. uh, and then, obviously, you get to a, uh, a state of... Uh, fundamental happiness and excitement and all the usual things that parents get excited about and mild terror as well. Yeah. And then when did you find out that things were... So we had a scan and the scan was going fine and then a couple of days later um, Flo didn't feel well and had some symptoms so we went into hospital uh, she went into hospital of course because I couldn't go and uh, as a consequence, I was then rung and told, well, actually, um, things are not going at all well. And she'd begun giving birth way too early. And how old were they at that point? Uh, 21 going to 22 weeks. So it was early? It was early. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, but this process then went on for a little while mm -hmm. and we lost one child and then we kind of... I mean, we spent nearly a week in hospital. Oh, that's so... Yeah. Um, and you're trying to literally hang on to the second child and lots of mums lose one part of twins. And um, sadly, that wasn't to be. How was that day? You said it was a long day. Uh, okay. It was a very long day and you're so tired and you're so overwrought and run through and... Uh, and you are this... Also, it's very tough, even in modern maternity units. So all around you, mums and dads are giving birth. Yes. And true. you're tucked away in a corner of yeah. a, of a uh, hospital um, trying to save a child, or in reality, knowing, because you've been given pretty good advice, mm -hmm. that it is very, very unlikely that your child will either survive or that will survive in a healthy form as well and that if you're, you can take said child home there is a high degree of risk of significant uh, deformity or disability by reason of coming so early. You know, they just don't develop in the right way. They need to be a mum's tongue, basically. So uh, that's a tough gig because all around you, you can hear women giving birth, uh, people being all excited uh, and which makes it very difficult for the parents, and we've been through it, but as I say, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other people have been through it as well. And you spent a lot of time talking to your child as well. Yes, we had a very special uh, couple of hours where we communicated our hopes and dreams and fears and aspirations and sadnesses and also um, 
uh, and obviously held his hand and and was with him in circumstances where we probably understood this may yeah. not have a happy outcome. But um, the fair point to make is I've yet to meet a parent who didn't appreciate, even if it is a short period of time, in neonatal intensive care, when the hospital tries to preserve the life, but also um, makes a delicate judgment call that um, some time for the parents as this yeah. life takes what is inevitably, or in 99 times out of 100 is an inevitable course, is utterly priceless. Mm -hmm. And there's a very difficult conversation that the surgeon has to have, the consultant has to have with the parents about what do you want us to do? And do you want to try and resuscitate? Do you want to try and... Mm -hmm. And that's not an easy one, but I would, my lesson would be that day we spent, uh, albeit long and difficult, was priceless. Yeah, a day that you will always be with you. Yeah, of you course. And... You 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 um, you try your hardest to uh, encapsulate it, remember it, and savor it, because you realise it's probably not going to be um, uh, long lasting. And the bit that really affects you is. Um, you know, there are lots of mums and dads who don't get another chance. So you know in the back of your mind, this may be your only time ever in a maternity ward and you may only have a day. And that, if that's what life brings you, that's what life brings you. But that's a lot to take in. What did you call your, your babies? Uh, Teddy and Rafe. Obviously, this is such a, such a, the worst thing that any parent can go through, the absolute worst thing that any parent can go to through. But I guess having people like yourselves in Parliament who go through these things means that you can advocate on behalf of other people who have experienced it as well, which you have done. So I had a 49-day sabbatical, courtesy of Liz Truss, uh, where I was on the back benches, uh, which meant I could take part in uh, the back bench debate on uh, this particular issue and uh, was able to speak on this and make the case on this and have continue to advocate in a variety of forms with Department of Health, with uh, individual ministers. Maria Caulfield has been very helpful. And also to try and um, uh, advocate in, you know, the letters MP give you clout, there's no doubt whatsoever. And whether it's myself or my Labour colleague Toby Perkins or others who've been through this and there is an all-party group on baby loss of which cabinet members set it up and many people, one of the health ministers, Will Quince, is very active in that as well. There is a very strong voice, cross-party in Parliament, making the case for uh, better outcomes, better services um, and uh, shouting the corner for those who feel uh, utterly devoid of a voice. The neonato care bill is currently going through Parliament, something that you have pushed for and supported. And that's about giving people proper time off to after something like this has happened. Yes, um, I, I think it's long overdue. It has got cross-party support. Um, it's in its last mm -hmm. stages in Parliament right now. And bluntly, it provides support to an individual who's been through this um, because uh, you, you can't go back to work straight away and you shouldn't be fundamentally penalised in your employee status mm. by reason of a disastrous maternal event that has affected you. You um, are also pushing for less of a postcode lottery in terms of care. It is an honest fact to say that in this wonderful country it is not a universal nature of care mm. and you could be trying to give birth or having a difficult pregnancy in a particular part of the country and you will not get as good a service as you possibly will do in a specialist hospital in the centre of London where there are an awful lot of very impressive professors and experienced people. Mm. Do you um, think it's good enough for maternity care at the minute? I think, listen, I think it is very good. I know that there's things like the Ockerton Report and other reports. Bluntly, we, it, it is very good in this country, but it could be a lot better. You know, um, it's 2023, we could, A, we should have as close to universal approach. Secondly, there could be better guidance of how you deal with uh, births at 21, 22, 23, 24, 25 weeks. 
and a better understanding of how you handle that. Um, and every child is different, every mum is different, but we could be a lot better at that. And I think they are heading on that journey. I can imagine that the, you know, when you were pregnant with, um, when your wife was pregnant with Kitto, it must have been a stressful journey for the obvious reasons. Yes. But when he arrived healthy, that must have just been, I can't almost imagine. Well, um, relief, happiness, and, and, and the honest truth is um, uh, the degree of pain for those who sadly are not able to conceive and take home a child is enormous and they will never get over that. They just, they, you just don't get over that. Um, your life goes on, you get up, you try to go to work, you try to have a positive outlook on life, but, uh, you know, there are too many people out there who really struggle with that. So uh, it's mostly relief and then obviously the underlying happiness of and the delight of 421 wake-ups. And you were saying obviously about him being such a glass half full child as yes, well. Yes, he's a very, very lovable young man who seems uh, I, I, worryingly optimistic about everything in this rather tricky, complex world, which is delightful. And that's the most, the sweetest part of his character, is that basically he seems just very chirpy about everything. Thank you so much for sharing the story. My pleasure.